Hello friends and welcome to the Weekend Catch-Up Club, the coffee morning show brought to you live every Saturday, direct to Facebook and Twitch and available later on demand at youtube.com slash gamertagged and podcast services. Grab yourself a drink, grab some snacks, kick back and relax for just the next little while because joining me today is special guest Lauren Kay, the social and marketing lead at Into Games. Enjoy. Your setup yeah. looks looks super pro as well. This is going to be the best, hi- highest end production episode that I think I've probably done. <laughs> oh, I know. I love it when I find somebody who has like a good setup. Like it's yeah. just, it's such a, it's such a rarity. All official a, and director like. I know, right? That's the thing. It's like you're live producing whilst hosting, whilst yeah. trying to have a really engaging conversation. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know. I just, I actually just tried my first thing because I just decided like it's, it's time that I, that I move into the um, video world because I think video is so much more effective than audio. Like I, I, I'm still going to do the audio in uh, like iTunes stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to transfer it from a video, but I like video is just so easy to share in comparison. Totally. Um, yeah. So I've just done my first episode and I'm just, I'm really nervous about how it's going to look, but I haven't done, <laughs> I haven't all, done all the finesse. So, um, so we'll see, we'll see how people take it. But it was that yeah. thing of like, oh my God, how much of this do I actually want to go hardcore with this? Yeah. Oh yeah. We probably need some budget for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Completely. Yeah, I know. I know. It's like, it's all fun and games until you realize, oh my God, it is actually an investment and it's work and it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your, your, your microphone was how much? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I know. I know when people ask my, when people ask me about my mic, I'm just like, just go get a blue Yeti, sweetheart. Like, unless you're like recording every day, just, just go get a blue Yeti or something simple. Yeah. Like, do not invest in what I have because it's yeah, yeah. not it's, worth it. It's fine if you're doing it every like all the time. You're you're putting out exactly. stuff all the time. But if you're only doing it for Zoom calls, a little bit overkill, maybe. <laughs> just a little tad. <laughs> just a little tad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We amazing, talked to, though. Yeah. Like I mean, we <laughs> talked to um uh we did a voice actor interview and they had a mic that was worth ten thousand dollars. And we were just like, oh. Jesus! It was wow. it was gold as well. It was one of those right. like really intense mics, and it was just like, oh my dear lord! But he does um he does advertising, so like that's the thing. Right. Like well, that is sense. probably like one one job doing a commercial or something like that is like gonna get him a lot of dough. Totally. I wonder if that's like a, an Electra voice microphone or something because they are crazy expensive it must aren't be. they it, yeah, it must be something insane but like yeah but i'm i'm nowhere near that level i'm a, i'm good with what i have i don't need no 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 but yeah no but yeah, so so laura we're kind of already into it i normally start with just doing the intro but we're kind of just free-flowing anyway so i may as well just use this as, as the start of the show anyway so yeah. please Tell us about yourself. You are the social and marketing lead for Into Games. You're a podcast host that She Plays Games podcast. Give me the full introduction as to who Lauren Kate is and what you do. Oh my gosh. It's so weird because I actually have to talk about myself. I'm not used to this. Like so You're I, the center of attention for, for this episode. <laughs> uh, I Yeah. So basically, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm exactly that. Um, the sort of marketing and social lead uh, is actually kind of like my first official role in the games industry. Um, so for the last like 10 11 years or so i've essentially been like on the outskirts of the games industry i came in as a podcast co-host on a show called kingdom hearts union um just talking about kingdom hearts one of my friends in high school was just kind of like look we're looking for co-hosts to do this show do you want to come on and like talk about your love of kingdom hearts because i know you love kingdom hearts i'm just like yeah (laughs) um (laughs) and like it was so crazy because like obviously now i have like pretty set up but then uh on a budget of a university student i couldn't really go out and get like some something flashy so i got myself a microsoft life cam 
And to be honest, <laughs> it was the best choice ever because I am a, I've come from an Italian American family. We use our whole bodies to talk. Like yeah. just to, you have to like actually physically make out the sound with your hands before you actually get it out. Otherwise, you don't know what you're talking about. So like for that, it was perfect. And like every day, even now, like I do uh, Final Fantasy Union with my husband, Daryl, and uh, he's always just kind of like, Lauren, look at the freaking mic. Look at the mic because it sounds different when you talk into it. And I'm just like, I'm so sorry. I don't be, I just, I can't help it. I get so excited. Um does he so, not yeah. understand that this is performance art that you're doing here? <laughs> I know, but yeah. it is it is the trouble. It is the trouble. Like nobody can see me like moving away from the mic and understanding that I am now like 40 yards in the other direction. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so from that, I um I started so I, I kind of met Daryl. I met Daryl through this website that I was doing these podcasts for. And um one day him and his buddy Kyle just kind of sat me down and we're just like, do you want to do game reviews? And uh, they threw at me Trials HD, which I'd never played a Trials game before in my life. <laughs> but and, 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 like it came out later that it was actually like a test because they figured we don't we're not going to start her off with a game that is like that she can write in her sleep. You know, we and yeah. also I mean. In terms of relationships with the publisher, they it was a risky move to just throw me like you know something really intense. So um, they were just like, "All right, we'll we'll try her out with Trials HD," and I nailed it. And then um, I went on to do quite a few reviews for them for GamingUnion.net, and I did uh, like news posts and all sorts of things, community management, like kind of like every a bit of everything. Yeah, and. Um, then it just kind of got to a point where we weren't really getting very far with the um, with the website anymore. Daryl had to. Daryl was working on the website full time, and he had to quit that and move into full time work. So things just kind of went went a bit sour. And then um, it wasn't until actually the birth of my first child, who's uh, now turning six in November. Um, we decided to revisit YouTube and uh, we had tried YouTube in the past. I've always like thought I want to do something on YouTube because I just love editing video. Yeah. Um, it's something that I've been doing since I was like 14. And um, I was just like, there's something there. There's something that speaks to me with YouTube that I know that I can do and I know I can do well and it was just finding that thing. And then eventually it got to a point where Daryl and I started making Final Fantasy videos. And um, it just worked really well with what we were already doing. And uh, we we tried out like a bunch of different things. We tried new shows um, and other things. But then for some reason, like we did these sort of what we call them like listicle videos, where it's just right. like, you know, weapons, um, weapons guides and this kind of thing. We did it for Final Fantasy 15 and it just, it just took off. And wow. we made about like, I don't know, like $5 off of our first video. And like, we just thought there's potential here. Like there's yeah. potential here that we're actually like making money off of this already like let's just carry it on and uh like back then i mean we had about like 3000 subscribers and now we have t over 200,000 subscribers oh, shit. um wow. and yeah it's like really insane and it's been amazing it's been like incredible the final fantasy like our final fantasy union fans are just are just the loveliest people ever um and uh, while we were doing that, like Daryl's kind of like the voice and the host and the writer, I was the video editor. And as much as I loved doing video editing, I also really like talking yeah. with people and like, and performing. Um, that's kind of like my background when I was in university was doing performing arts. So like, I was like, all right, I need something. I need something for me. And then I sort of started thinking one day, I also want something that is going to help people. Like I just was thinking like, I really want some, I really want to do something for other people. And at the time there wasn't really a lot of podcasts focusing on women specifically within the games industry. Yeah. And I was just like, 
you know what, I have a lot of like contacts that I sort of kept up with who are in the games industry. Why don't I just like see if they want to come on a show and like talk about their stories and how they got in. And um, like, it just, we, we've just sort of snowballed from that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're over 50 episodes now um, in about like two years or so. And um, it's been the most amazing experience because like I've learned so much about about games, about games development, about yeah. um, how things work. And I've met so many incredible women um, who are working in the industry and then other people as well who've kind of come into my life. Like I know, well, you through through this stuff. I know yeah. um, Stuart DeVille who works with uh, Game Dev London um loads of people from like women in games and uh like anisa sanusi from um limit break and the code yep. coven team like everybody like i've just met so many people through this like little podcast <laughs> idea that i had and uh yeah i just i really hope that it's making a difference in in some girls' life or person's life who's considering joining the games industry but just haven't hasn't seen somebody like them in the industry yet you know yeah that's uh, that I, I find so so amazing is is you're opening up and you're you're highlighting opportunities for um to for for role models to get their their message out and and be an example to mm. school school girls um anybody at, at a young age that is looking for role models to get into tech subjects not just gaming mm. not just necessarily the games industry but you know highly skilled tech subjects is, is hugely important and mm. the games industry for such a vast industry is massive there's thousands and thousands of people it strikes me as something that is also incredibly small in terms of mm -hmm. it's quite an intimate, small, like family feeling group. And anybody that you reach out to, I've certainly found this um, since I started this little show, tiny little show in comparison, is that everybody is always super generous and wanting to jump on any, any kind of podcast, any kind of content that anybody really asks them to and they're more than happy to talk about their experiences, talk about their expertise, their learnings, and just get to talk about something that they've devoted their careers to uh, or their passions to or their hobbies to or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just been an amazing experience. And obviously it seems to mirror that um, that feeling with, with yourself and with your show as well. Oh, completely. And I feel like there's almost kind of like an activism that like automatically takes place within joining the games industry, especially as a like sort of minority person, because um, it is an industry that like is already stigmatized by the general populace as well. Like, you know, uh, there's so many times where with moms, I have to have the conversation of like, why do you play games like the games industry or like games just seem so toxic I don't think I would let my kids do that and yeah. this kind of thing. This is what I'm like fighting all the time. And it's so difficult because those stigmas just run so deep. And like every day, some article is coming out on like the sun or like um, uh, whatever it is just saying about how mm. bad like games are or this person did this thing and they played a lot of games and stuff. And, you know, I just, I feel like we have to, it, it's kind of our duty to keep games alive and keep the industry growing to stand up and like talk about things and, um, and shine lights on, on the good that's yeah. coming out of the industry. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, like, it's an easy scapegoat, isn't it? For for yeah. like rag newspapers like that, they'll say they'll oh my gosh, auto yeah. automatically associate violence with with video games. Video games are too violent, and then they'll mm -hmm. automatically say, "Well, that was the cause of X thing that that happened." Yeah, but it's it's, just, it's such an easy scapegoat. I mean, like there's mm. there's viol violence in movies, violence in literature, that, but because it's a, a a game that they think it's just for kids, or when it, they've got adult warnings on them, that instantly goes to that scapegoat. It's like, well, clearly there must there must be more oversight, or um, games games are bad. Games have to be banned, and and whatever regions of, of the world, because that's clearly the only culprit at play here. Um, oh my gosh, game, yeah, it's crazy when you when you look at things that are so wholesome, like Animal Crossing. 
Wing as well, which are couldn't be any more different than than your Grand Theft Autos or your like Dooms or things like that. There is so much wonderful um, spectrum of games out there that mm-hmm. are that are giving so much more back to cultural uh, uh, messaging and experiences that are not just call of duties that are that are great in their own way don't get me wrong i enjoy mm-hmm. call of duty as well but it's not just all about killing killing the enemies it's about other experiences that can only be experienced through the medium of video games and it's such a rich industry as well and it's still oh fairly God, yeah. fairly young right i mean there's so many wonderful things coming out mm-hmm. it's, uh, and of course yeah the, with um you know the culture is obviously going through a bit of an ex- an ex- an explosion right now in a in a bad way obviously there's yeah. a, lot of, a lot of work to be done um yeah but but there's so many good stories which are um getting getting drowned out as well so i think the more that we can do to kind of talk about the positive side of it it is elevating the gaming space to be more accessible to be more diverse more inclusive and yeah. just just sharing the what we love about video games can only hopefully be a good thing Exactly. Like I would never, I would never consider like sort of going against it, like in the sense of, you know, a lot of people fed up, like wanting to just go away from it. And like, like, it's fair enough if you, if you don't feel like it's like, it's helping you with your mental health or whatever, like if you, if that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. But ultimately like the kids who are looking up to us are still looking up to us like a lot of them are like uh, it's it's weird because like you don't what we see on twitter you sort of assume that everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet and everybody knows what's going on but like parents aren't even aware of what's going on with blizzard and activision like they aren't even they aren't even remotely aware i tell them about i i would tell any of the parents who have kids who are gamers in this area about it they would not have had even a, the slightest idea that that has happened, which is just maddening to us because obviously like we all know, like that's like the biggest, hottest story and just sort of like everybody in our industry like knows about what's going on. Yeah. But like it hasn't, it hasn't touched into mainstream. Like they haven't, they haven't really done a lot to, um, get the message out or or parents just haven't really noticed about it but i think like that's the thing as well that's really hard with games because like um there's a lot of people who still assume that games are just a phase that kids go through like that it's just something that oh well they'll just grow out of it and stuff but it's like but games actually grow with you as well like i'm not playing the games that i played when i was (laughs) I, I like I'm not playing the same games that I was playing when I was five. I'm not like I am still playing like Mario, but I've expanded my um, genre vocabulary of games yeah. like just to, to extreme amounts. Granted, at the moment, I am basically going to the same <laughs> the same old games every time. Comfort but, food is fine. That's what's great about gaming. Yeah, there, there's exactly. such a diverse like things that we can tap into. But there's also the comfort stuff that you say, okay, oh, I just wanted like like stomp on some Goombas today. So we're gonna be doing that yeah. and collect mushrooms and everything. So <laughs> completely, completely. And um yeah, so yeah, it's really, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. Um, but hopefully, please, please, please tell me that like something's happening that's good. <laughs> you know? know, like I tell know. me that we're making something, that we're I, making I, something I, happen. I think it. I think it is. I think it's it's now got to like a like a fever pitch point where change has to has to happen and and mm. it, i think it will happen but again it, it's like how long will it take to actually happen and not be just lip, <laughs> yeah. lip service you know um it's it's very easy to just say okay this is this is our new procedures and protocols and we're hiring equality experts diversity experts but are you really is it in the core mm. is it in the, the bones the foundation of the company yeah and i and i think that's what is it kind of encouraging is you're seeing a lot now of just people leaving these these big companies to want to start their own indie studios so they they mm-hmm. can actually really control the culture in a in a really positive way and do it from from the the ground level up and create these smaller games these smaller experiences which uh, I was actually chatting on, on the last podcast there with um, with Alex from Polygon Treehouses yeah you can you could take 
greater risks in the indie space because they tend to be smaller they tend to be a bit more edgier you can mm. you can really do a bit more with them there's not that now, there's still pressure of course but there's not the like millions and hundreds of millions of dollars thousands of people are working on them so you yeah. can be a, a bit more of a risk taker but also the culture is is something that can be really be cultivated in a in a far more positive way and i think that is what is so beautiful about about the indie space and uh, i love seeing more and more of these indie games just popping up it really feels i don't know how you feel about this but it really feels like the indie dev space right now is really hitting it's coming into its own with mm. idea xbox with the, the wholesome showcases from the, the switch uh, broadcasts and all this kind of stuff it really feels like indie is the space to be right now because there's so mm. much wonderful stuff coming up yeah no completely i just i i love wholesome direct so much for that because like there's so many games that i feel like speak to my daughter my daughters especially like from the indie space more than more than triple a all the time um i mean so ali i mean granted i guess it is it is probably still indie-ish but like bug snacks was like a huge hit amongst yeah. my kids yeah. um like they just they loved it they they still love it they act like bungers all the time bungering <laughs> each other um but like you know, I get really excited over over those games because I think, I think uh, especially like coming at it from a like sort of parental perspective, like I don't think the AAA space opens a lot of holds their arms out very much for kids, with exception of like Nintendo. Yeah. Um, they they really and especially like the the mainstream space as well, like um. Can tech can can sometimes be quite toxic to kids, and like yeah. there's a lot of hate towards kids, and you know, like granted, like you can hate kids, you like you can like not like kids, you know, like that's fine, but at the end of the day, all of us deserve to have the childhood that we had when we were growing up. We could play games pretty much any game we wanted off the shelf, like we could play even like yeah. Mortal Kombat at the age of like you know when it first came out when i was like six or seven it was like on the on the verge of being not appropriate but it was still like okay it's like okay well it's just yeah well that's pixels I mean, it, yeah because i mean think of it we're not in back then it wasn't the age of social media where everything is everywhere mm. if if you know parents look at a game they don't really know that there's going to be fatalities and uh you know yeah. r- ripping people's hearts out as as uh one of the yeah. special moves or anything like that so you got away with maybe a lot more whereas now completely there's on the online gaming space there's the tiktoks there's social media twitter facebook everything is everywhere and it's hard to not not police your children and p- to protect mm. them but like allow them to be free and engage with their friends and in online spaces but again it's the, the toxicity is a very real part of it as well and my my son is only nine months old i've got all this to look oh, forward Bobby. to oh, I, have, I have no that's idea a good age, though. they're it's, so it's, sweet it's the perfect age he has to stop growing now he's just like, just stop Aww, it he's, he's just perfect right now oh, i know so and cute. I can't imagine what it's going to look like when he is maybe seven, eight, nine, ten, mm. and then into his teenage years. It's like, oh my goodness, what is what is the, the gaming space going to look like at that point? And uh, oh, terrifying, really terrifying. I know, so as, but as I think parents it's be are really already good. there. Yeah, mm. I mean, as par- parents are already there, I think, oh my god, now I didn't get it before I was a parent. I kind of was aware of it. It's like, and yeah, that is a concern. And I'm like fucking hell that's a that is a real concern i'm now kind of really worried about for parents it's like how do you manage it how how do you ah difficult difficult. i mean the 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 problem that i'm encountering a lot is um is the sense of like and it's it goes the same with like the tiktok and the youtube you know like it's the fact that it's it's always sort of unsupervised and granted like i'm being a parent of two small kids it's it gets and also working you get to a point where like you're just like okay child you need to just sit down and give me like you know 20 minutes to just get my brain back and sorted so that i can actually like watch you as a as a as an actual parent you know um and like a lot of the times um 
just thinking that things are safe with um, with things like Roblox, um, I find time and time again, a lot of parents who will like sort of let their kids play Roblox freely and it, it can be so dangerous. And you just sort of think like, you know, um, I, I know that these parents want the best for their kids. And I know that these parents are really caring about like protecting their kids from certain dangers in the in the gaming space like i mean i get it all the time that there's these parents who want who want their kids to play minecraft online and um you know they don't they don't necessarily know how to and and this type of stuff and um it's just yeah it's really it's really hard to sort of go to them and be like you know like there's there's so many resources there's like the family video games database and stuff that that really been helping helping um create a, a, a space for parents to look and like research oh, easily okay. um on like video games that are appropriate but like it is it, it's it's the whole debate of the cell phone of the well for me it's a cell phone smartphone um it's the whole smart when to get a kid a smartphone debate but just with games like it's yeah. just it's so yeah. difficult but i know so many games that <laughs> kids can play that i'm just like these are perfectly safe and you don't have to worry at all can you still get the them. old nokia phones with our yellow and black and all they have i on actually them have snake. one yeah i actually be... <laughs> have one that was my first that was my first uh phone when i came over actually like um because i couldn't set up a plan or anything so i had like a pay as you go nokia yeah. and but now the girls use it as a toy yeah um, it's amazing how <laughs> how fast they pick up the touchscreen phones my my, oh my boy gosh, is yeah. is already i mean he, he grabs the phone just to chew it mostly that's all he's concerned yeah. about but he's already like picking up and looking at the screen and, and like trying to just like mash the screen it's like they instinctively know this is supposed to do something and yeah. it's terrifying because nine months he should not be getting any screen time what the heck is going on here oh. But he's, he just <laughs> sees something that, that that lights up and flashes, and then he instantly wants to play with it. And I'm thinking, no, you you cannot get drill in the connector. I, <laughs> I need that to work. You're not allowed to destroy the phone. I although, know. although say that the new iPhone is is kind of on the cusp of coming out. Maybe I could get the baby to destroy my phone as an excuse to get a new phone. Maybe that would <laughs> could work. Do. Or yeah, you can get, well, yeah. if it's, if it's the connector bit that you're worried about, you can get one of those like Japanese little thing. Like you, they have like in Japan, they have like such a good trend of like plugging up holes in your phone and stuff with like <laughs> cute, anim cute furry animals or cute like oh, animal thingies. Yes. You can get one of those and then the baby can just be like, whoop, but then it will probably learn how to take it out. And then, and then you'll have the same conundrum. Yeah, you'll probably swallow um, it as well at that point. At least it'd be cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true too. Oh, parenting is hard. There's no solutions that are okay. easy. Parenting is so difficult, and uh, <laughs> I, I don't have anything to complain about because my wife does the most of most of the heavy lifting with feeding and nursing, and oh yeah, uh, and I just gotta I just get to talk about it rather than actually <laughs> do nearly enough. So I, I apologize yeah. in advance to uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's totally fine i know i know but it, it comes and then and then you get to the point now like we're yeah we're we're such we we involve our girls a lot with uh gaming and and that type of thing which is amazing the switch has been so i basically fought for the switch because like uh daryl is not much of a nintendo fan bless right. him um he just Divor I, divorce I think, him straight away just divorce I know. him Get it was, no, no <laughs> it just it was just the thing and it, it was kind of similar to me right like i was a victim of my circumstance i i had parents who couldn't like in a million years afford yeah. to have a con a nin, nin, all the nintendo consoles plus yeah. like another console so they chose sega genesis for me which i was very appreciative of having yeah. sonic and then sonic, when it came yeah. when it came to the point where i was i was able to choose a a platform for myself um so basically <laughs> i used to do this thing where i would um, in order to make money i had a catalog there was like a kid catalog and i don't know if they all do this anymore they probably don't because of the internet age but like basically i would have like my family and stuff buy things from this catalog and then they would um i would get a cut essentially of what they bought oh 
Okay. Yeah. That's cool. It was like a really cool system. And like, yeah. I made a load of money from that. Um, and I mean, well, I say a load, <laughs> it took me like, it took me like six months in order to raise a hundred dollars. So not like a lot of money, but for a lot of money for the time, yeah. like for me as a, like a little kid. So, um, I think I my nana bought most buy stuff. you a Legend of Zelda cartridge, limited edition <laughs> I at know. that age. <laughs> I know. Can check that out. Yeah. Uh, so I had, I, I had all these ambitions. Initially I was like, I want American girl doll, which is like this really famous brand of girl uh like doll in america um they were really cute and they came with books and i just i really loved the samantha doll so much and i wanted her and then immediately like well sorry like a little as as i started earning the money or whatever i started sort of thinking like uh do, do i still want the american girl doll? i don't know that i want american girl doll and then for whatever reason i was just like i want a playstation i want the playstation one I'm going to yep. get the PlayStation one. And Good then choice. I bought the PlayStation one and I only had enough money to buy the PlayStation one. So I had a demo disc and, um, that was what I play, what I played until <laughs> like at least oof, the first, like the first year or so until my Nana very kindly let me, uh, buy a game for, um, for it after I got like a really good score on my report card. I remember. Um, but like, Oh, that was that was so good. I I'm really gutted yeah. because my demo disc got stolen. Uh, some <sighs> boys down the street borrowed it and then never gave it back. But it had the opening FMV to Parasite Eve on it. Oh wow! It had uh, Cool Borders, which was so much fun. Oh, what else did it have on it? I mean, it had a little bit of Rugrats, which was still fun and yeah. stuff. But like, it was just it was it was such a good demo disc and. Oh, I, I just loved it so much. <laughs> R.I.P. So demo good. discs. Remember we used yeah. to get demo discs on the magazines as well? Like yeah. Every month you'd get them. Oh, if only we still had those. I don't know We're we still do. trying to hunt down. Um, I don't know as much anymore. I know they like yeah. come out with like a load of a load of like sort of stuff that just kind of hangs around your house. Yeah. Um still. But like I know that um well, at the moment, Daryl and I are really trying to pick up a Final Fantasy VIII one because uh, we would love to have the demo disc to the uh, the demo disc for the original Final Fantasy VIII, um, right. the original Final Fantasy VIII demo disc. Yeah, uh, that magazine would be amazing because uh, that demo had completely different music to the final version and stuff. And it's just like Daryl had it like when he was growing up, but yeah. um, but I I I didn't. I didn't have it. Yeah, no. Probably we never, going for insane know. money on on eBay now because it's yeah it's diff, different music. It'll be like a this rare golden oh, yeah. disc find or something like that. It yeah. is, and like <laughs> Renoa, who's one of the main uh, dude ragonists in the um in the uh, game, she's like in it and in the final version selfies in it. Like it's a completely different. It's a completely different experience to the final game. Wow, see, this um, is where I, yeah. I, I show my uh, my gaming black hole because. <laughs> Final, Fa Final Fantasy is, is a series I have not really any real experience in. Seven Remake it's was niche. the first time I'd, I'd played Seven. Uh, really? I played a little, uh, 15 was my very first one. And okay. I played I played a little bit of it, and I and I kind of liked it. I liked the uh, the more kind of real time, super fast movement. It looked gorgeous, of course, as well. And sure. I liked the the road trip kind of vibe as well. Of the yeah. friends all hanging out and cooking and stuff like that. But then yeah, yeah. Se Seven Remake, um, I thought damn this is this is something this is really impressive so i yeah. need to i mean i don't have a ps5 yet so i'm waiting mm -hmm. to play it properly on the playstation 5 version but i've got it on the ps4 pro and it is no slouch on that either it is visually incredible oh yeah but, uh, yeah no you're not hurting uh, with the playstation uh 4 version yeah. at all no totally totally so um i'm just wondering when when they'll ever get around to getting episode two and obviously the other parts of it because i'm aware that uh, Midgard is just this tiny little, like meant to be a tiny little slice that they obviously expanded and stuff yep. like that for for remake. Oh my gosh, yeah! But there's so much more to go, and I'm like, should I play the OG like PS1 version, which you can get on pretty much every single device now, even your iPhone and mm. tablet and stuff? Should I just like drop a few bucks and get it on Switch or something, or should I? 
should I just wait for the eventual day, maybe 10 years from now, that the, the, the complete remake is, is actually complete and then to do it that way on the PlayStation 7 or something? Yeah, you know? <laughs> I know. I know. It's a hard choice. I mean, like, so the... I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're aware, like, the, the remake doesn't actually follow the original game to a D. Yeah. Like, it, there, yeah. is, there is a lot of liberties, in, especially in the final, <laughs> the final, like, 10 minutes. It's just kind of like, Daryl and I just looked at each other, just kind of like, what just happened? Why Was it good or bad? Was, do you think it's, 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 like, pissed off a lot of, Weird. like, hardcore fans? just weird i mean i don't know how you feel about spoilers on here but it was just like there's certain characters who should not be who should not be around that are around okay. and you're just i, kind of I like don't mind in. spoilers if listeners okay. warning now spoilers yes, warning for now Fantasy warning now okay. i mean it has been like almost <laughs> well it's going to be a year and like a few months or whatever yeah. uh but yeah so zach uh at the very end of the game the guy with the big sword at the end who is carrying cloud um he's supposed to get shot up and die in the original game okay before this before any of the game happens and so he's alive and you're just kind of like what huh. what um sephiroth you don't even encounter sephiroth at all in the original game in the first portion of the game at all right like the first time you really i mean you see him you see him like this so the bit with Shinra Man Shinra Tower where you're like going through all the tunnels and stuff like look um going to find President Shinra like in the original game it's so creepy there's like a red there's like blood stains all over the carpets and then you see President Shinra killed over on his desk with a big sword in his back and he's dead uh and that's kind of like your first indication of who Sephiroth kind of is okay and then you don't encounter him again until you head out and then you um you go to uh this cave off in the distance and um you encounter this like sort of big sea snake mythical creature um that's like really hard to beat like you're not really supposed to beat it at a small level um okay. you'll get insta killed uh but sephiroth apparently has killed one quite easily and he's like the dead thing of the snake is like hanging outside of the cave and you're just kind of like did sephiroth do that and then everybody's just like oh huh? who's sephiroth <laughs> and blah 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 and that kind of thing so like that that whole like kind of thing like completely changed in the remake i'm really excited for where they take the remake like it's it's very curious because yeah. i i at first I was a bit like, why? But now I'm like, actually, like it makes me kind of it makes I'm I'm curious. They have my attention and yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um but so you, in terms think, of like Oh sorry, sorry go I, ahead. I, no, I was gonna just say, do you think they're they're doing that so like hardcore fans have something interesting and, and unexpected to look forward to for the future episodes as well? They they're not getting what yeah. they expect. They're they're getting like some some U turns and and misdirections and things like that. I think it is it is probably partially that. It's also partially like I was saying to Daryl like Daryl and I talk about this a lot, uh, but like I was saying that it might also be because the developers don't want to be bored remaking the same game. Yeah. <laughs> you that's, know, that, that's fair. Like, that's totally there's fair. There's so many of them who've, <laughs> who've done the same game. Like why, why stunt their creative, their creativity by just regurgitating the same game again? Granted, they probably shouldn't have called it remake if they're not going to remake the same as that game. But I can understand the I, I could understand the desire to try and make a different experience. And also yeah. like there's that thing of like, you know, trying to catch trying to uh hit lightning the same time twice or whatever. Sure. You know, like Final Fantasy Seven was a really big lightning in a bottle moment for Square Enix. It was for Square back in the day, like Squaresoft. It was um they weren't the games were popular but like final fantasy 7 was just like off the charts like yeah. what 
what happened like how is this game so good and granted they did spend a lot of money marketing the crap out of that game um (laughs) but uh but yeah and it really put them on the map so it's just like do we remake it and then have everybody criticize us because we did a crap job with the original with like the remake or do we make this like it's entirely new thing so that they can't necessarily criticize us too much about about certain scenes being different like certain scenes being remade i guess um but yeah no it's it's a it's a fascinating subject and like i would say in terms of what to do i mean i think it's 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 a difficult one because the gameplay is so different between remake and like sort of the original games. Um, I personally always recommend playing. If you're going to play a final fantasy game starting out and you've had no experience, start out with 10 because 10 is just the easiest to play. Um, okay. It's the story is completely different. There's no, there's no relation to the previous stories or anything. Um, but it's uh it's just i think it's it's the it's the most easily digestible game in the series for me personally i think they're all on um, game pass now as well or a lot of them are on game pass so there's really kind of no excuse yeah yeah and see this is now a final fantasy podcast where do you think they're going to go with episode two like how much of the of the game do you think Uh, there's going to be into that into but I guess based I mean, off what we kind of know of of the first episode and where yeah. they got to with that, like I can't remember what we sort of said. Um, I mean, they're gonna have there's gonna be some set pieces that need to happen in in this game in in the first in the second part. So uh, there we we think it's gonna open up like this is just theorizing. We think it's gonna open up with. Um, this flashback sequence that happens in the original game. I mean, this would be the most, this is what we were thinking would be the most epic opening is um, a flashback of why Sephiroth is who he is and why, why things are the way that they are with cloud and stuff. It's kind of like a backstory thing Um, that has to happen in in the original game. That's what happens right after uh, your party leaves Midgar. You head to this place called calm and, um, and cloud sort of, tells everybody who doesn't know about his history with Tifa, his sort of history with Tifa and that type of thing. Um, so we think it's going to start with that. And then um, I'm not, I can't remember where we said, where we said we were thinking that it was going to end. I can't remember if it was like, um, it might be Nibelheim. I don't know. But either way, it, it's going to end. It's uh, hopefully it will end with a bang type of thing and yeah. keep you keep you wanting more. I hope so. So you don't think Nintendo are just going to do a complete? Sorry, not not Nintendo. Uh, Square are going to do a complete left turn and just make Episode Two an entire expansion for Smash Brothers. Oh my gosh! Yeah, could you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> and then just plop in like Kazuya throwing yeah. Sephiroth off a cliff. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lauren, we have been, we've been talking for about 45 minutes here, and we haven't even Ooh. talked about your role into games. Oh, my that's gosh, like, yeah. That's, that's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> Tell me know, all about into so games and, and your role there. Uh, <laughs> sure, absolutely. I mean, into games is amazing. Um, so what we're really trying to do is we're trying to help the next generation of um, of people getting into the industry. Into the industry, we're helping a lot with schools, Um helping them uh, get into avenues and sort of um, uh, programs to help them build their skills in in, in a way that's uh, efficient and effective for like the games industry. Um, we offer events where we try to help get people jobs and give them advice on like what they should be focusing on to get jobs in the industry. Uh, we just hosted a massive uh, career fair uh, where we had studios like supermassive playground games um uh hangar 13 like a whole bunch of them creative assembly um wow. come together and uh they presented their work cultures and that ter- type of thing but then we also hosted panels like how to get into games art, how to get into game audio um 
how to get into programming, like all these different, all these different avenues of, um, of the games industry and game development. Um, and then now, um, sort of the beginning of September, uh, we are actually helping host the Women in Games Game Jam uh, as a part of their uh, Women in Games Go- Global Conference. So um, we're hoping, yeah, we're hoping like a lot of people to sign up. Um, it's a really great opportunity. Uh, and um, we're also, we have like an Eventbrite page where you can uh, team up with a mentor in order to um, help you with your uh, development of your game jam, of your game jam game, wow. essentially. So lots, it's a lots lot of stuff of happening. Things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on. And like we have the video games ambassadors program. Um, we also have the video games. Uh, we have the into games champions where we like have uh, particular people in the industry. Um, we bring them in and then we actually offer them workshops and a chance to improve themselves uh, within uh, their roles as well, help them with like, uh, public speaking and, um, like help them just be confident in talking about their role and, um, and, uh, diversity training as well. So like, it's a whole, it's a whole slew of things that we just do to just try to make the industry a better place. Yeah, it sounds sounds absolutely amazing. And and tell us all about your uh, experience on the Twitch front page for what are your oh my panels. goodness, <laughs> oh that was so stressful. I know. I um so yeah, like I mean, I just I was so happy that that all went. That was kind of like my first initiative in the group. I was just kind of like you know, we could try we could try and get on Twitch front page. Uh, let me, let me just see who to talk to <laughs> about it. And, um, it was this whole, there was a whole rigmarole cause like we weren't affiliate yet. We have to be affiliate and all this sort of stuff. So I was just kind of like, Oh my God, don't tell me that my first thing that I'm doing on this job is like, I'm leading them down a dark path that they won't be able to do and we won't be able to do it. And then I'll fail everybody. And it was getting to that point where I was just kind of like, this is not going to happen. Like, this is just not going to happen. But then immediately it, we we got the email through, you're going to be on front page. And I was just like, oh, thank God. And I just felt like the heavens opened. And I just was like, yes, thank goodness. <laughs> and then it was the whole stress of like, oh, my gosh, actually, we're going to be on the fr- Twitch front page. And it was it was really good. And um, we didn't really <laughs> we didn't really, I don't think told any of the people who any of the panelists who are going to be live on the ah. twitch front page that they were going to be live on the twitch front page yeah. which i think was better because i think you'd you'd freak out internally at least yeah like i um yeah <laughs> so <laughs> that know. was definitely the smart play to say yeah, yeah. We're, just pre- we're just this is just offline we're pre-recording it it's like nobody's going to see it and then all of a sudden mm. you're you're live on the main page where tens yep. of thousands of viewers are going to hopefully tune in and, and see it and well anybody logs into twitch that's the first thing they see it's like oh, oh yeah shit. that's, that's yeah. Terrifying. yeah yeah it was it was fantastic and um yeah, no, I just, it was, it was just like one of those really amazing moments where I'm just like, yes, <laughs> I did something. Yay. <laughs> it was you know? amazing because uh, I, I watched one of your panels and I thought, Warren, Warren knows how to do this. She's a podcaster. She knows how to host this. She's going to ace this. It's too easy. <laughs> was, uh, it was an awesome I just panel. like people. <laughs> yeah, I just like people. And I like, I like making people laugh and talking. Um, yeah, no, it's just, um, it's only recently that I sort of discovered that this is what I actually enjoy doing and like, I actually am okay at it. You know, like it's, it's just something that I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm an introvert normally, like, you know, like every day me is like, "Ah, (laughs) hi, how are you? Whereas like, but doing this and like talking with people and this kind of thing, like I just, I don't know. I got, I got, I got the bug and I just love it. I think it's just so much fun to actually like learn about other people. Um, obviously like I, I given the chance to talk, I will talk a lot. Uh, I do act out as well. (laughs) You got to act out as well. (laughs) Yeah. But I do. I just, yeah, I love, I love doing this and, um, 
yeah, it's been it's been super fun. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's what's amazing about this medium of whether it's just podcasting, whether it's panels, whether it's live streaming. More and more companies are realizing that it's actually it's it's, it's difficult to do. I'm not going to disparage any anybody oh, yeah. for, for that. It is difficult to do, but it's also once you know how to do it, it's actually kind of easy to do and set up and get everybody connected and and actually do a show like this, like yours, like like the panels on Twitch, or putting it out to a LinkedIn Live or to a Facebook Live or to Periscope on Twitter and things like that. The technology is there, and if you just know, know take a little bit of time to work out how to use it, you can actually have these amazing. Um, connective experiences with your communities and audiences that I think a lot of companies are now becoming aware of and they're thinking, oh, we can actually start doing this kind of stuff. And rather than falling back on like blog reports or things that are static, things that are just like the written word, which is important, don't get, don't get me wrong, of mm. course, that's still hugely important, but you can actually hear directly from the people and you can see the people that are commenting on, on X thing, creating X thing. And I think mm. that's just way more powerful. And seeing that more and more companies are embracing that, that it is not a normal um, form of content, a form of expression, form of getting the message out there. I think because we're in lockdown as well, more and more of the audience is just really latching on to actually seeing the people that are creating the things that they love and hearing directly from them. It's not this highly polished, highly curated, edited piece, which are they're, they're great. There's they're still a, 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 a place for them, definitely. Of mm. course, that's, that's still hugely important to have that. But it's also nice to kind of see the scrappiness of it a little bit. Like you're seeing a little bit of kind of behind the curtain that everybody's working from home. Everybody is still pretty terrified for a lot of things for going out. And yeah, it's just like, you can see what's in our, in our rooms and uh, we're just yeah. all trying to create these kind of spaces where we can talk freely and um, champion what we absolutely love about a, a certain industry and talk directly to each other and to like faceless audience as well. I think it's so valuable this, this this past 18 months or so is really highlighting just how important that is. Mm. Yeah, no, completely. And like I the biggest thing as well for me has been accessibility and that type of thing as well. Like I mean, you know, I I am just I really feel for people who who can't leave their house or can't do certain things yeah. because of the fact that they have a disability or they have something where they just can't they they can't go out and get to some place that they need to get to and even people who are trapped because of their country you know like they they just happen to yeah. be born in a country that doesn't have a lot of opportunity around them and they want to branch out and make a living for themselves. I know so many people who like are in countries that don't necessarily have a huge, a huge like sort of games industry presence, but they're making waves by yeah. connecting with people in countries that do have that, you know. And totally, I just yeah. think it's been it's been so incredible, and I just I really hope that it. I really hope that this carries on, you know, I know it won't necessarily carry on in quite the same way forever, but yeah. like, I think this connectedness um, has just really given such wonderful opportunities to people who didn't have those opportunities afforded to them before. And yeah. um yeah, hundred percent. I think that is one of the the best things that is actually coming out of this is people and companies are beginning to realize that the being in the office constantly five days a week or 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 more sometimes when obviously you have to mm -hmm. kind of crunch and work overtime and everything like that, um, it's not essential anymore. You can actually be way more productive and way happier going to a hybrid model, and more companies are 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 embracing that, and mm -hmm. it just shows that. We have all the technology um, at, our, at our fingertips, at our disposal, and or if you're lucky enough to have, you know, a nice camera, a nice microphone, a nice computer, <laughs> obviously, to, to do your work. Uh, the, the caveats are there, obviously. But if you have all of that, it, 
really doesn't matter where in the world necessarily you are because you can very seamlessly connect and do your work and um, tap into a talent pool which may normally have have never been an option because it would have involved a full relocation to another country or things like that and a lot of people either you know they they can't they don't necessarily want to or there's Mm -hmm. other issues at play where they just this is can't up and up sticks and move around the world for for a job opportunity there's a lot of you know uncertainty as to you got to get through your probationary period first for a lot of companies so am i going to move around the world for a six-month probationary period that maybe yeah exactly you know all this kind of stuff so it's, it's wonderful to see many more companies embracing the fully remote for, for certain circumstances, but obviously we, we don't want to lose the in-office culture at all. So mm. it's, it's, it's really opening up this 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 flexible, malleable working model that a lot of companies are more open to than maybe they weren't before, which is great to see. Mm -hmm. completely although i must admit i've lost my tea my tea skills (laughs) i don't know how to make tea anymore sorry everybody my tea skills are are subpar now (laughs) in comparison to what they were when i was actually working in an office um yeah (laughs) <laughs> that was so, one of the first things that I just like realized when I moved over here is just how particular people are about teas and oh, and don't. making them. Yeah, I know. Is it, is it really milky? Is it just? Is it like super dark? Is it somewhere yeah. in between? Oh, some people put the milk in first, then the tea bag, yeah. then the water. I had what somebody is that who would, about? That's so I wrong. had somebody no. who could tell. <laughs> he could tell that I hadn't done it that way, and I was just like, See. "What is this?" what is this you know um yeah yeah Yeah. no i must admit i never i never did the microwave trick ever in america we in america my (laughs) nana did have a kettle and i did use a kettle to make my my hot drinks um but yeah no no i i did have one guy come up to me during he had just done a meeting Granted, this was a very small local company, thankfully not in the games industry, but uh, came out to me after a meeting and I had made him his tea and he was just like, I, I grant this guy is never in the office. He's in the office like maybe like three times a year. Okay. I like my tea this color. So wow. next time you bring it to me, I like it this color. And I was just kind of like, wow, make your okay. own tea, pal. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thanks yeah no it was uh it was it was very eye-opening experience yeah there's (laughs) a lot of um yeah a-holes out there unfortunately it's like okay you can wear your tea or you can make it yourself i know i know or you can just suck it up sometimes yeah somebody made you a cup of tea be grateful I've had so many times where I've like ordered, I've ordered something at a cafe and I know that somebody's like not heard me and like given me like a a, a latte without like the, the, without like vanilla in it or something. And I'm just kind of like, oh, well. Send that back and throw it at them. Clearly they've (laughs) messed it up. Jesus. (laughs) No, I just, I just like, there was one day actually recently because the mask issue has been such a big thing. Like it's been a big, like as much as it's helping, it's also horrible for understanding people. Um, I went to Acosta and I was just kind of like, uh, could I have a vanilla latte? And I knew when he talked back to me, I like, I knew that he was saying caramel. But I, what I didn't realize was that he was saying two. So I oh, was gosh. waiting, waiting, waiting. And then all of a sudden, I, I don't know why I didn't check. <laughs> well, I never checked the bill anymore because I just, I just kind yeah. of, it's, it's the contactless. I just go and no receipts. I don't need the receipts. Uh, and then um, you're turning into he, a Brit. You're too polite. That's what it is. I know. I really <laughs> am. And uh, they, they, they brought me. They brought over two, two large iced caramel lattes to me and i was just like like, i only ordered one and they were like ready to offer me the money back and stuff and i was just like no don't worry about it it's fine i'll just put the other one in the fridge um one for later then i guess yeah it was amazing i didn't have to go out the next day or do anything like i was just like oh my gosh i have two days in a row where i have a caramel i mean granted it's not the vanilla but it's caramel still and it's yummy so I have two of them. I have one for today and one for tomorrow. It's amazing. 
but I think that is, I think getting back to games though and stuff, like I think that is like, that is, you know, just be respectful of people. Totally. Love people. It's not difficult. It's really not difficult to just be, <laughs> be nice and be accommodating mm. and be respectful. And you Yeah. Know, so, yeah. So uh, before we wrap up, what's next for uh, the She Plays podcast? Sure. Um, we are transitioning to video. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a bit nervous. I don't know what people are going to think, but I have uh, this lovely, lovely person, Taylor Lyles, um, who actually kind of comes from close to where I used to live in America. She lives in um, she lives in Maryland, and she's actually a technical uh, editor for IGN. Um, and uh, yeah. like I'm I'm just it was it was so great to get to speak with her and yeah. and stuff and then i have i have a few a few people lined up as well to just do um uh the podcast after that one but she's going to be my first one as as a video so we're yeah. going to see how it goes but other than that i'm just i just love my little community all of my yeah. spg people like we just get together and just love talking with each other about life stuff and and yeah. chilling and stuff it's it's just been really yeah i i think that's been one of the best things about about this whole experience is just like the small group of people who i just can hang out with and connect with and um yeah, yeah i love them all and awesome awesome why well, I, I cannot wait to start watching the uh the podcast as well as listening to it it's be, Yay! It's be <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's gonna be experience totally totally uh so ladies and gentlemen this has been the latest episode of the weekend catch-up club podcast a massive thank you to lauren for joining me this evening um it's been a good hour of such a rambling roller coaster chat it's been absolutely brilliant that's the, the best thing about podcasts you, you just kind of have a conversation it could go in any other direction we don't know where it's going to land but we always kind of hopefully circle it back to the games the gaming space and it's been absolutely brilliant lauren thank you for for tonight it's been awesome oh absolutely it's been so amazing <laughs> and i'm just so thankful that we that we got this to work and that we're we've done it and you know but no completely thank you so much for having me on it was a blast anytime anytime you can, you can come back as a regular collaborator if you want to uh doors always open so where can people get in contact with you if they have any questions they want to reach out anything at all they want to tell me about their feelings about Final Fantasy. Maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, my Twitter handle for my personal is uh, Level Up Lauren. Um, I felt really chuffed about myself when I came up with that. Um, <laughs> I just was like, this is a good name. Um, but <laughs> not to be cocky. Uh, but yeah. And then um, if you want to find out more about my podcast, uh, you can head to to uh my twitter handle for it is she plays podcast or uh she plays games.co is a good place to go as well oh, wonderful um, wonderful yes. great so ladies and gentlemen thank you again for taking the time to listen to the podcast i will be back next week with another amazing guest but until next time take care and we'll see you again soon bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.